For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Prayer, give us, O God, such love and wonder that with shepherds and wise men and pilgrims unknown, we may come to adore the holy child, the promised King, and with our gifts, worship him, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And with the lighting of the fourth candle, we bring our Advent wreath to full blaze of light in the hope that we may see clearly all that is made known to us in the coming of Jesus. As you come in the stillness of night, great God, enter our lives this night. Overcome darkness with the light of Christ's presence so that we may clearly see the way to walk, the truth to speak, and the life to live for him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The sentence for today. This child will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Let us pray. Jesus Christ according to Luke chapter 1 beginning at the 26th verse. Glory to you Lord Jesus Christ. In the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin Ma virgin's name was Mary and he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. 
He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her, who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. For the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. The other reading this morning um, uh, that is set down for today is a reading from Hebrews. And I just want to read that because I'm going to preach from it. But the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companies. And in the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will wear out like clothing, like a cloak, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Therefore, we must pay great attention to what we have heard so that we may not drift away from it. For, it, for, it, for if the message declared through the angels was valid and every transgression or disobedience re received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You know, friends, the, um, the, the study of history is a complex thing, a really complex thing in lots of ways. I remember when I was boarding house master and principal at King's, I was also a, a, a teacher of history, uh, modern and ancient history, for about 20 years. And I remember when I was doing some postgraduate work and my supervisor in history and my supervisor uh, at the University of New England said to me, the writing of history is never really objective. It is in the end subjective. Now we know that is probably true in lots of ways, we'd hope that maybe it's more objective than that. But um, for instance, the early writers of Australian history decided it was not important to speak particularly about women or to speak about our indigenous people. Uh, the writers, of course, were accused of um, writing a, a white male settlement type of history. And of course now historians, uh, with other motivations, uh, are attempting to sanitise that history and the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction and um, historians are trying to write other types of history, which is okay as well. It would be great though if historians wrote fearlessly, objectively and without bias or hidden agenda, would it not? 
So often, and yet there's another view of history, so often people uh, would say that history is just a string of unconnected events which the historians will analyse and research and make some sense of to inform the, uh, to, to uh, look at the past and inform the future through their own, again, selective personal assessments which often arise from a particular cultural, political or socio-economic point of view. Now that doesn't mean that history is not true, does it? It just tells us that people take a particular point of view when they are looking at history and they, be, they become selective. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with having a bias about what you write. I mean, for instance, I don't know, I watch The State of Origin. Do you watch The State of Origin? Oh. Well, the State of Origin, can you imagine if New South Wales won sometime? And um, they won, and um, what would be the reports in the paper? The reports in the paper are basically um, the writers from New South Wales, and you read the, the New South Wales press, of course, after the game, you would see a great glowing resume and report on the match. And if you went to Queensland, who lost, you would, of course, see a different report. And you would think they were two completely different games. But in fact, they're reporting on the same game, they've watched the same game, and they're coming up with different assessments based on their agendas that they have. Nothing wrong with that, both are true. But they have different agendas, don't they? If you read the Bible, great slabs of the Bible are through the lens of theological history. That's what they're through. And if we look at the Gospel this morning, the Gospel of Luke, um, it was... Um, it was a, a gospel about a particular style of, and type of history. And the epistle to the Hebrews, which I just read then, uh, was written with a particular agenda as well. And the agenda is the place of Christ in the religious history of Judaism. That is the agenda, that's the agenda. The book of Hebrews is an exposition. It's a sermon, that's what it is. It's not just a written letter. It's the guy who's writing a sermon to people out there. And I guess before we look at it, the beginning of Hebrews is very important to understand the agenda. And the beginning of Hebrews says this, from, that, from verse one, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors, in the past, through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the hand of the majesty in heaven, and so he became much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Here the writer brings together the history of the people of God and how God has communicated with them throughout that history. And he constantly does that through his word. And he communicates with you and me today through his word. This is the agenda. This is the agenda of why it was written. The history here has a purpose. It's not just random events where God has traveled with and spoken to his people by the prophets, by the law, by the Bible, through those narrative stories and by the angels. And now what he has finally done in history, he has revealed himself and spoken to us by his son, the progressive particularization of God's movement throughout the history of the world. Spoken to us where the word became flesh the incarnation of Jesus, the coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus that is proclaimed in the gospel reading today and indeed in the other readings. The coming of Jesus, the birth of Jesus is the end game for us. It is the end game of God's purposes. Right, we are living in the end game right now. The beginning of the end, Jesus came and he is establishing his kingdom. That's what it's all about. He is the end game. 
And so, friends, you see, biblical history here is not some string of unconnected, random events. The whole point and object of it is that for thousands and thousands of years, God has moved with us in history and in time and interacted with us. For thousands of years, ultimately culminating in the birth of Christ 2,100 years ago. God in the flesh, the very same one who created the universe by his word of power, has come and dwelt among us. You know, it's no wonder that in, that in the remote hills of Bethlehem, where a few shepherds and sheep had gathered on a cold, wintry night, the heavens exploded with a chorus of angels. That intersection, that intersection of heaven and earth has come together, ultimately, in that event. He arrives in the flesh for one purpose, to reconcile the world, humanity to himself, ultimately achieving that through the cross and the resurrection. The writer of the Hebrews in chapter one, verse five onwards to the end of the chapter, he says that the son, this majestic son, this all powerful Christ is superior to everything in the universe and everything in heaven. He's superior even to the angels. Now, friends, as I was reading this, and as I looked at this, and as I saw the gospel reading today about Mary and the angel appearing, I thought to myself, I stopped and I came to the realization that in all my ministry, I've never preached a sermon on angels. Never. Why? I wondered why. Now, there is an assumption in the Bible, an a priori assumption, that angels exist. The Bible doesn't try to argue the case for them. It simply states a fact. They exist. And in fact, they've been mentioned 273 times throughout the Bible. So it's pretty prevalent, the times that they've actually mentioned angels. So what do they really, what do I really think of angels? What do you think of them? Who are they? Where are they from? Where are they? What are they supposed to do? And there, there, there are many modern views of angels. I mean, we get them on glossy little cards at Christmas time. We get them on all sorts of other cards. I mean, there are retail outlets that are just strictly set aside for angels. You know, you can buy little wings, you can do all sorts of things with them. Our secular world really do like angels, probably more so than we do. I mean, there was a survey taken in the UK a couple of years ago, and that survey that they, and one of the questions in the survey was, do you believe in angels? 80% of people said they believed in angels. 80%. None of them go to church. But they all believe in angels. Extraordinary. And there's, a pop, there's this popular mythology about them. There was a fellow who had a symposium at an at a, at a, um, intellectual conference, an academic conference in Aspen in Colorado. And he's at this conference, and one of the topics that this academic decided to have was a topic on angels and he had it in this great auditorium and within a few hours he filled the auditorium with people waiting to hear about angels I mean what is it all about I mean what do they look like do they look like Marilyn Monroe in a white sleek outfit with lovely big fluffy wings is that what they look like I don't know might be in your imagination um, or are they little cherubs flying around like little children angels is that what they are? Or perhaps they're um, like the fairy godmother, you know, they'll give you whatever you wish type of thing. Let me tell you a story about that. Um, an angel appeared at a university faculty meeting and told the dean of the faculty that in return for his unselfish service, he would be rewarded with his choice of wealth, wisdom and beauty. Choice. And without hesitation, the dean selected wisdom. It is done, the angel said, and then disappeared in a cloud of smoke. All the other members of the faculty stared at the dean with absolute amazement at this incredible event. Finally, one of them whispered, now that you have infinite wisdom, dean, 
say something. The dean looked at them and paused. And then he said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> so, I know, it goes over like a lead balloon sometime. Um, we must not focus on the mythology. Not on the mythology, we must focus on what the Bible actually says about angels and understand that that way. One theory in the book of Hebrews and why it was written, it was actually written to counteract the practice in the first century church of people worshipping angels rather than worshipping Jesus. And there was a big movement of that. And so you can see in this passage that he's talking about don't worship angels because angels are, Jesus is superior to angels is, is the point that he's making here. The Bible tells us that angels are not to be worshipped. But here in Hebrews, he describes angels as ministering spirits, servants of God. That's what they are. They were created before the foundation of the world. Um, they're outside of time and space. The tyranny of time is the decaying element. They don't die. And they have many roles. We have archangels, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael, whatever. And we have benevolent angels who um, rebelled against God. They've got choice, freedom of choice, and were thrown out of heaven. Ultimately, the satanic ones and Satan himself. They do have great authority and power. There is a fixed number of them. They don't procreate. We know that. And we don't become angels when we die and go to heaven. We actually are elevated above the station of angels when we die as God's people, we are adopted as God's sons and daughters, we are told. The angels are described as the hosts of heaven without number. Someone said that even every star has an angel. The size of the place. Every time they appear, they don't appear like Marilyn and look nice. They appear and they say to the person who they appear to, be not afraid. So they have got an awesome presence if they appear. I guess the question for me, and I'm sure it is for you, how do I get my head around all of this? How do I understand it? And I'm comforted by the words of Jesus, because the words of Jesus, when the disciples asked the question of Jesus, tell us about heaven, he looked at them and he said, how can I tell you about heavenly things when you don't even understand earthly things? You've got to start there. See, my finite little brain cannot comprehend the infinite. We don't have that capacity. But what we do have is the information that we have here before us. The information before us. And here in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Hebrews, is really, it's really an exposition, as I said before, a sermon. And if you, if you look at it, it's a sermon on Psalm 8. And if you read Psalm 8, you'll see how it's locked into that. So in all of this, if Jesus is who they say he is, if this quiet birth of this little child in the backwaters of Palestine, he is who he says he is, to me, then so what? What has that got to do with me? here now. What has it got to do with you here and now? And this, in this lovely chapter in Hebrews, there are these little hook words. And what they do is in Greek, they hook up and they grab the, the first chapter and pull it down into the second chapter. And that little hook word is the word therefore. And he says in chapter two, this is what we should do and this is how we should react. He says, therefore, we must pay most careful attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. There's the application to the sermon he's writing. We must pay careful attention, lest we drift away. Because the message of the angels and the prophets and all that's gone before is real and it's binding on us in history. We must have it as, it must have an impact on our life as we go forward. It can't be just tacked onto the edge. 
And of course the warning here is that even though we have this great news of salvation of Jesus, we still have the ability not to treat it seriously and to turn away from it. We still have that ability. We have the ability of choice, don't we? And, um, and of course God created us that way. The ability to choose is, is a blessing, but it also can be a curse. In a consumer-based society, uh, it, it is the essence of our life and our liberty in a modern world. And we know how important choice is because we live in a COVID world and when choice is taken away from us, we notice how difficult that is and how restraining and constrictive that is. And people are experiencing that in Sydney at the moment in the, some of the hot spots. And indeed, worldwide, we see that. But the warning here is that we must not allow all the choices that we have in life to divert us from this great truth that has been revealed to us in the coming of the Son of God. And it's so easy, it says here, to drift away, to find ourselves lost and in another place, in a situation that we have no control over. The word drift away is a nautical word. I'll finish up here. I could go on forever about this. But it's a nautical word. It's about being cut from your moorings and being drifting out to sea and being exposed to the elements and, being, and things being out of control. Have you ever been in that situation where you've felt that you're, things have, you've lost control of things and things are not happening? Quite often. I have. I'll finish with this story. I remember that I, um, when I was a young bloke, we were, it was Christmas time, and we were sitting on the beach at Etlong in the north, uh, central coast of New South Wales. And I had my mother and father and all our family were there and my cousins came down and one of my other cousins, male, came down. He was a little bit older than me and he brought with him a catamaran and he slid it down onto the beach. And he said, come on, come on, let's go out and we'll get into the catamaran. And I said, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I'll get in the catamaran. I've never been on a catamaran before, never. So I got on this thing and we sailed out into the, into the middle of the bay and then all of, us, all of a sudden this enormous nor'easter blew up and off it went, and the sail got hooked, and off it went, straight out through the heads, and we sailed out past half-tide rocks, went across the front of Ocean Beach, and we were heading towards Lion Island. And I looked at him, and I'm trying to hang on to this thing and work out what I'm doing, and I had no idea, other than I didn't want to tip it over. And uh, he said, and I said to Kenny, I said, Kenny, have you ever been in one of these things before? And he said, no, he thought, I thought you had. <laughs> so here we are. And so all of a sudden, we, th we then hit a sandbank where there was waves on it and it tipped us over. And here we are in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the ocean, floundering about. And we had to get this thing back up and we finally got it back up onto its right and back up. And then we tried to tack back and we tacked back for about an hour or two hours. I don't know how long it was. Anyway, we finally got back, tacking back into this great nor'easter. And we got back onto the beach. We learned how to sail it very quickly, can I say. And you know, they had the cavalry out looking for us, of course. And, uh, and that was, but I, it was a hopeless situation. I'd never been in a situation like that before. I, it was out of control. And when I look at this word drifting away, that's what it means. We can find ourselves in a hopeless situation by the choices we make and what happens in our life. And I said, and the warning here from the book of Hebrews is, do not drift away. Have the message of Christ central in your life and don't allow your choices to push you away from God, but make the right ones. And may God bless us as we look at Christmas together in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at uh, St. John's Anglican Church uh, for uh, this lovely Advent 4 uh, as we celebrate the coming of Jesus into the world. Um, thank you for being with us, and um, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we should remember that. May God bless us all. Amen. 